Well, thank you for joining me again this evening. I hope your day has been going okay for you. Uh, my day's been good. I've had a busy, busy day. I just uh, came out for a walk, walked from the one end of the White Rocks to the other, which was very refreshing today and some beautiful little cameos of uh, God's creation, which is always good for one's mind and body and spirit. So that's been great. And then came home with some great pancakes and Nutella, so you couldn't beat that, could you? So I'm looking forward to sharing a little bit more with you this evening. One of the lessons you learn in Pauline's story is that quite often you have the progress followed by resistance. I think in our lives we tend not to think of it like that. At least for me, I forget sometimes that the devil is out there trying to frustrate and to intervene and to destroy. And certainly Pauline's story has been reminding me of that quite clearly. The need to pray very specifically each day. And isn't it interesting in the Lord's Prayer, that which is a kind of a pattern of daily prayer, and do not lead us into temptation or deliver us from the test or watch us. It reminds me of Jesus speaking of Peter, you know, Satan has desired to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that you will not fail. Your faith will not fail. So it is a reminder to us. As Pauline began to work increasingly with these sometimes disturbed and uh, some people call them delinquent boys, I know I sometimes, as I read this, I see myself in it. My mom used to be so despairing of me, she would threaten me with an old-fashioned place called Borstal. Um, well, uh, so I suppose I was a bit of a, a frustration to her. But these, these young men, they had lots of problems, and uh, the police used to come to her from time to time and ask her for help and assistance. If there was a big gang fight, uh, they would say to her, maybe you would turn up and you could defuse the situation, which she did on a few occasions. But when these successes came, she was then very conscious that it wouldn't be long before there would be some big overwhelming attack upon her life or upon the work or somebody in the work. And that's exactly what happened. And so after one such situation where she'd seen God working to preserve life, then things began to go slightly badly. And it all has to do with a young man called Tony. One night, and I'll pick up the story now and we'll follow it through. Pauline says, one night I came home from the young people's meeting early for it because I wasn't feeling so well. I was shocked to find my door wide open and the window beside it burned and smashed. Obviously somebody had gone in through the window and then opened the door. The back door was wide open and my dog at the time, Coca-Cola, was nowhere to be seen. Cautiously, I went inside assessing the situation and I knew that the sliding door to the upper level of my house was open when I left. It was now closed. Oh, I was really nervous because I thought then maybe somebody is still in this house. So I quickly left the house, went to my next door neighbour and asked them if they would call the police. When they came, we entered the house together, found the sliding door was now open. So obviously the person had left, they had been in and their poor Coca-Cola was in the bathroom stunned and was just regaining consciousness. When I spoke to my neighbour about the incident, I asked did she hear the dog barking and she said no and I realised then that whoever did this was somebody who, who was familiar with the dog. Japanese houses are noted for their huge cupboards and I guess missionaries are known for the wide array of stuff they collect and store for all their work. Mine were ransacked and everything that could be sold of value was taken, like my recording equipment, my camera, tape recorders, and anything like that, radios. But then also my Bible. Why would a thief move my Bible? I noticed it had been disturbed and put in the waste paper bin. But then something else was intriguing me. At the side of my bed, on my little table, I had a, a little pack of cards, index cards, and on each card I had the name of one of the boys. And I would use those cards to pray for each of the boys in succession. The cards had been all shaken around and moved, and one card was left on top. The name of that top card was Tony. Hmm. I wasn't sure, and I didn't want to point my finger to anybody in particular in case I was wrong. Now, a couple of days later, 
an anti-Christian or a very unsympathetic newspaper towards the Christian faith came out with this headline, God did not protect his servant Pauline Hamilton. And I really felt very badly about this because it was a smear on the honour of God in a very public way. The following Monday evening I had a visitor, Tony, the boy whose name was turned up on the prayer card. He brought a friend, a friend with him and I never mentioned anything about my misfortune. Tony was acting strangely, insisting, for instance, on sitting underneath the window rather than in the chair facing the window that I had indicated. I said to him, how come you're out of the army now? Oh, he said, I'm on a basketball team and I got a special pass to let me go and play and so forth and I have these dates that I'm allowed to be away. Well, I was able to look at the pass and I can see a counterfeit pretty quick and I knew that was a counterfeit pass as well. We had a pretty pleasant enough visit, but on Friday, Friday night, when I returned from the boys' school, a group of other boys were waiting for me. Other gang members, most of whom, in fact, all of whom I didn't know, and they were shouting at me across the road, Grandma, Grandma, come here, we want to see you. Oh, what's up, I said. Oh, we hear that Tony's talking big, Tony's talking big. He's the one who robbed you, and he's hiding. He's really laying it out for you. And he means to kill you. Well, Tony wasn't a gang member. He was a bit of a loner. And a loner can be a lot more fearsome than gang members, especially when they get scared or get cornered. I wondered if police suspicions were putting pressure on him. Tony's been talking really big, they said. Oh, he's just a big bag of wind, I said. No, 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 not this time. He really means business. I swallowed dryly and was about to open my mouth when a spokesman continued, we are going to protect you. You have to promise, don't go anywhere without letting us know. None of those shortcuts that you take. Oh, come on now, I said. How are you going to protect me? I'm going to set a watch every night. I'm going to set a watch at one end of the lane and at the other end of the lane. And we're going to exchange at a certain time. One group will go and one group will come. Well, you know, the eight gangs. Yes, the eight gangs took complete charge of the situation. They would, have no com they would have no problem with killing Tony, except that I insisted that they keep their hands off. I said, look here, boys, you've got to let the law take care of this. They'll get to the thief in time. But they did their watch every night. Between half twelve and one o'clock, they had the changing of the guard. And they came inside and I got them all hot chocolate or soup. And we had wonderful conversations, great conversations, and this carried on for five or six weeks. I could see how Satan had overstepped himself this time, because God was using this robbery to put me into sustained contact with the kind of boys I would never, ever have reached otherwise. I didn't even know that some of those gangs existed. But the heartache for Tony was not over. When the authorities caught up with him, finally, he was tried and he was sent to prison. And from prison, I received very, very, several very bitter letters from him. He blamed me for the imprisonment, for letting the police take him. Somehow, my letters never reached him. So it was a time of real suffering for both of us. You see, I had known Tony since he was a little boy. And when he was with his mother, very young, she got cancer and had terrible suffering. After that dreadful experience, it seemed to do something to Tony and it made him into a sort of a quite sadistic. I remember one day coming in and hearing my dog, Coca-Cola, whining, crying out. And I found Tony in there with a pin, a safety pin stuck into the dog's tongue. I was so angry, I didn't even know what to do. Maybe, maybe his robbing me had something to do with that day. But I wasn't going to give up on Tony. And so I did what I always do. What did I do? Well, you know what I did. I wrote to five of my most faithful prayer partners and I said, please concentrate prayer on this boy. And as a child, Tony had won more scripture memory contests than anyone I've ever known. And I thought with all of that word that has already gone into his heart, then I'm sure God will honor his promise when he says that his word will achieve the things that he purposes for it. When he was released from prison after several years, friends suggested that I should go on furlough. This would be a good time. You know, you, might, you never know what he might do. He did threaten you. He did warn you. 
I knew it was time for furlough, but I just didn't feel that to run away was right. I thought that if I ran away, that was giving the devil victory. And so I just tried to treat the whole thing as another test of my commitment to this task. And I really got into my summer program. And in fact, nothing happened. Little by little, the whole incident was forgotten. It was about two years later, during the Moon Festival in September, when the moon is at its brightest, I had a caller. Earlier that evening, I had spoken to a group at the Christian Industrial Centre in the city. And then I had this special night, for on the moon celebrations, they have these moon cakes and so on, and it's a really good time of feasting. I didn't get home to half twelve, nearly maybe one o'clock in the morning. This time I was living behind the United States Information Service, and the guards, they often kept an eye on my place when they knew I was away. And when I got home that night, they grilled me excitedly. Where were you? Why are you so late? I said, well, what's the problem? They said, oh, there's been someone here all the way from Taipei on a motorbike. Yes, with a girl as well. They've come back three times. Hmm, I wonder who that could be. Well, they won't come again for it's so late, I imagine. So I bid the guards good, good night that night. I just got in, turned on the water for a warm bath. I just stepped into the bath and the doorbell rang. <laughs> oh no. Not now. <sighs> Drip dry. I managed to grab some clothes, Chinese style clothes. Brilliant. Great idea. And I put them on, ran to the front door. And though I didn't recognise the voice beyond the gate, I opened. Who was there but Tony? And a girl with him, whom he introduced to me as his wife. Well, I didn't really know what to expect next. But anyway, I quickly kind of composed myself, invited them in. Within minutes, Tony was on his knees, pouring out his heart to me, asking forgiveness. He had been out of jail for two years, and he couldn't live any longer with the guilt of what he had done to me. And when he finally told the whole story to his wife, she said, right now, let's go. And they had travelled several hours before they could see me. Those small hours in the morning were very, very precious, and I remember them well. Because Tony and his wife came to the Lord, put their trust in him before they left. Later on, he made full restitution of everything he took from me, with the compound interest added as well. In tempting me, the devil, or in tempting Tony to rob me, the devil had meant so much evil and so much harm. But God had worked it all out for good again. Seven of the gangs who protected me that time disbanded. A number of the members came to believe in the Lord Jesus, and Tony and his wife found the Lord Jesus as their saviour as well. Isn't it amazing, just looking back and seeing that? But that, of course, was only an ongoing part in the story. There's another little add-on to that. One young man, whose name was called Mike, came to me a few nights after this. And Mike was, of course, really anxious and angry and concerned because his father had put him out of the house. And I wasn't so sure that it was all, all his father's fault, though I knew he was an alcoholic and I knew that maybe he had good reason to be anxious and concerned. But somehow this young Mike grabbed hold of a sickle, the sickle I have for cutting the grass and the weeds in my garden, when he was in my home. And he darted off with the intention of going home to use the sickle with his father. Well, I said, you're certainly not going to kill your father with my sickle, I said. And I managed to rugby tackle him before he got too far. But then I said, you come with me and we will go and see your father. And after a long process, which I can't go into here on, the report, on, on our little recording this evening, Grandma Han was able to bring the two together and then she said, now what I want you to do is, I want to talk to you about what it is to be a Christian and then we're going to pray. She prayed for one hour on their knees, the whole family, before she left. When she was leaving some time later to go off, this is what her, his, Mike's father said. He said, I want you to know that I'm a Christian now too. That makes us one family in the Lord. And I'm going to be baptized in three weeks as a testimony to my friends. I am sorry that you've, you'll be gone by then on her furlough. I've never, I've never forgotten your prayer that night. You know, I can't, every night we have a chance to chat like this and 
I consider it a rare privilege to have this opportunity to talk with you and, and to share with you something of this book that has had an impact on my life. I've had this book for many, many years now, and it's been a tremendous blessing. This one is 1977. But it's just that it keeps reminding me of those simple, simple things. Be courageous, go in faith, keep praying, remember the devil's there, don't give up. There are so many simple lessons, and I am sure, I, I really am convinced that because of this kind of situation we find ourselves in, it's like an intensive course of memory, drawing out from us our memory, the things that have happened in the past to you and to me. And, and God is actually, as it were, face on with us now. And he's saying to us, I want to address these issues with you. Now, you may have guilt. Maybe you've been living with guilt over some issue, and you, you need to go and you need to put that matter right between the Lord and between that person or those people. Maybe you need to write letters to apologize, to make restitution. Maybe you need to write checks. Maybe you need to do all sorts of things. Or maybe you're praying that others will do those, God will speak to them, that they will do that to you. But is it not a time for us as we slow our lives down before God and really learn these lessons and pray about everything? Pray about everything. Invite close friends into your prayer circle. God is at work right now. God is doing things. The devil is the happiest person to see the coronavirus. He loves to see pain and misery. and He loves to see people blaming God for things that are not God's fault too. But God has purpose this time for you, for your family, for your friends, for your church, for your relationship with him. I really pray that you will, you, will, you will not, nor will I miss this great opportunity. So let me pray for us as we conclude tonight. Father, thank you for this wonderful continuation of the story of a life. Uh, Pauline is just an ordinary person. They call her grandma because it is just the sort of person they see. An older woman, single, without all the sophistication of so many people today. But she had faith in you and you were her God. And you have given us that faith, O Lord, and you are our God. We want to honour you and glorify you in our lives. And tonight, Lord, I pray that you will either make us sleep like a child, or our hearts are at peace, or if there's some matter in our lives that needs addressed, that you'll give us no sleep at all until we make that matter right to the praise of the glory of your great name. Amen. So, thank you for joining me. And I pray God will bless you and God will work in your heart and he will enrich you.